Colonel Rossi and Chief McDowell and the Chief Counsel, thank you guys for uh, being here. I'm just going to make a couple of remarks and we'll be done. I know the day's been long. And I'm hoping, my mom always told me I would lose my head if I wasn't connected to my neck. <laughs> I found out that it's probably correct, so I'm really hoping there's a short speech in this pocket when I reach for it. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> now, because I am the age of retirement, I can see nothing. <laughs> Optical assistance. So. Oh. What a day, what a day, what a day this has been. And all about me. <laughs> My favorite subject. It reminds me of a story I heard about this uh, Hollywood movie actress who had ran into an old friend she hadn't seen in a long time. And she was so anxious to tell her friend about how her life had been. And her friend couldn't get a word in edgewise. So she's just going on, uh, oh, the mansion, oh, the Bentley, oh, the celebrities I know. And this went on for what seemed like forever. So then after the uh, lady was just giving up, she just finally says, hey, you know what? Enough about me. How did you like my movie? <laughs> <laughs> and that's what this day seems like. <laughs> All this day about me, and now we get a little bit more about me. I know y'all are tired of hearing about me because I'm tired of hearing about me right about me. <laughs> um, I heard that story in an autobiography that uh, Burt Reynolds wrote. And uh, the title of the autobiography is, But Enough About Me. <laughs> I love that. The whole book is about you. <laughs> Every single page. But enough about me. <laughs> But it's a good book, and uh, I grew up in an era when Burt Reynolds was at the top of the movie industry. And I was surprised when I read his autobiography that his life was nothing like what I imagined it would be like to be uh, Burt Reynolds. So it's a, much, a very good read. So I'm just going to take a couple of minutes. Uh, I've been talking about my career and my time with the Guard. So I'm going to talk about briefly what it was like, what did I learn, what little advice would I give? And of course, the thank yous are the hardest part. I can't even say thank you without here to cry. <laughs> so, what was it like? Well, you, very few chances do you get to really upset your big brother, so <laughs> I'm gonna say it was like a scene from the Game of Thrones. <laughs> it was like the knights, the guards on the night watch. Now, I know most of you have never seen the Game of Thrones. <laughs> But the few of you, honest ones of you who have, <laughs> the night watch, there were guards, and they, they stood on the night watch, and they were there to defend the city, to defend the society, to defend their country from the wildlings and from the otherlings. And when I joined the guard, that was kind of what it was like. That's the way it was kind of explained to us. We had what was the, the Soviet Union was uh, around in those days, and it was the Cold War. And I would come to drill, and I would honestly think about what are my Soviet counterparts doing as we prepare to defend us from the wildlings. Now my brother, who's a big deacon and a great honest man, he heard me talking about the Game of Thrones, and he said, Tony, what are you watching that junk for? <laughs> I was like, man, it's very well written. Good cinema photography? <laughs> and he's like, it's nothing but sex and violence. <laughs> and I want you to know, I looked at my big brother, and I pointed at him, and I said, listen here. I didn't watch the violent parts. <laughs> Who do you think I am? <laughs> Masochist or something? <laughs> <laughs> My grandmother here, she would say, baby, that's just a devil. <laughs> but anyway, they talked about winter is coming. We were, we were prepared. We were prepared to defend our nation. The guard is there to try to keep us safe, to keep us away from the other links who would want to come and do us harm. And we took that job seriously. We trained hard. And I was, I 
I took my, my position on that watch uh, in uh, December 6, 1986. <laughs> 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 but, uh, <laughs> so what did I learn? I learned that Charles Darwin was correct. Because it was Darwin that said, it is not the strongest among us who will survive. It is not the smartest among us who will survive. It is those among us who are most able to adapt to change. And my career has been a constant change. As my commander, Colonel Volker mentioned, uh, when I joined the Guard, we had up fours on the ramp. And people who were F4 prof proficient never considered a day where we might not have F4s. I worked with guys who were just masterful at working F4s. But things changed and we got F16s. And some of them became frustrated, fell away by the side. And then we had guys, because the F4 was an analog system, so we would take some of the broken equipment, bring it back to the shop, and we would tear that stuff apart and we would fix it. And I was always, I was, you know, the new guy in the shop, I was scared to touch anything because I would always say, I don't want to break it. And I remember uh, Newbecker, who's been gone a long time, say, Tony, you can't break it, it's broke. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's here. Try it, fix it. <laughs> but those guys were good, they were talented. But when we got F-16s, they were solid state, it was a whole different system. It was just slide a box in, take a box out, and they hated that, because they, they said a monkey could do this. <laughs> and, uh, and a computer told you which box to take out, which box to slide in. So they got frustrated. So then after that, we got C-130s. And that's when I became a flight engineer, joined air crew, and began my travels. And the flight of the C-130 had turboprops that were like, God only knows how they were. They were magical. They were, if you open them up, it looked like a great big Swiss watch. And who knew how all that stuff worked, but those things worked. And I remember guys who were really proficient at repairing them. And their heart was broken when we got we lost the C-130s and we got the uh, 135s, which was jet engines. Doesn't have any props. So my point is, change and being able to adapt to change is the only thing that's going to allow us to continue to survive and to prosper and be successful as an organization. And today, things are changing at a rate much faster than they ever changed in the history of the world. And it's because of the new technological uh, uh, changes. And there's another big change coming with the quantum computing and the artificial intelligence. And uh, you have to be able to adapt to change. You can't just be the best 135 boom operator, or you can't just be the best 135 pilot and uh, think that this is gonna carry you all the way through. Um, as, so for the young guys, I tell them, well, what's the key to being able to adapt to change? And primarily it's education, and it's training, and it's having that mindset to be determined to adapt to change. Because our guard is changing, our society is changing, uh, our church is changing, our community, everything is having rapid change. The only thing that's not changing is God's word. And if you're not anchored to it, and you're not determined to keep pace, you will get lost in the change. So Darwin was correct. If we're to survive, we have to adapt to change. So what advice will I leave? I, I heard a, a quote by a comedian, of all people, um, Conan O'Brien, who said, work hard, be kind, and amazing things will happen. And that has been the testament of my career. I believe that wholeheartedly. I'm gonna tell you a brief story uh, that was told to me by a Tuskegee Airman, Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Jefferson. Jefferson was a P-51 Tuskegee Airman. He was flying a mission in 1944, I think it was, over southern France. His P-51 got shot down. Now, so, Tuskegee Airman, he's a black guy, he's fighting Germany, it's World War II, he's 
plane's going down, he gets captured. Then he's got captured, so he's like, oh my God, how can it, is this gonna get any worse? Well, he's taken to a prison camp, and he's being interrogated by a Nazi German uh, soldier. And Jefferson was telling me, he was like, this, this Nazi guard told him and says, hey, I, 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 I hear you from Detroit. Jefferson thought, well, you know, these guys are doing good intel. I'm surprised he, he heard that I'm from Detroit, but he was trying to be reluctant and giving up information, but he felt that was okay. Yeah, I'm from Detroit. And then the guard asked him, so, have you ever, uh, you ever heard of this club called the Greasy Spoon? <laughs> Jefferson was like, whoa, what kind of intelligence can I, <laughs> I hang out in that club. Yeah, you know this girl that works there on Tuesday? She's, she's like a manager. Her name is like Susie or something, Bobby Hare and stuff. Jefferson said, my head was exposed. Like, this can't be happening. This isn't, this isn't possible. He's like, thinking, man, I know her. And the guy says, yeah, I graduated from the University of Michigan. And on Fridays, we used to go down into Black Bottom and look, listen to the jazz clubs. So I was in this club, it was all black people, and they were, you know, some of our guys were kind of, you know, apprehensive about going into black mom in Detroit. He said, but that lady, she told us, she said, hey, you guys are here to enjoy the jazz, have a good time. Ain't nobody, nobody's gonna mess with you. He said, I always remembered her kindness. He said, and don't you worry. Nobody's gonna mess with you. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, wow, a random act of kindness from a lady running a club in Black Bottom had no idea the impact it will have. So yeah, my advice is work hard, be kind. Amazing things will happen. My father was one of the hardest working persons I knew. And I remember going to him and uh, complaining about work. And I was like, Dad, I don't like it. This is, you know, so smart. I said, work is hard. He's like, it's supposed to be hard. He says a reason it's called work. <laughs> if it was fun, they would call it fun. <laughs> they call it work for a reason. So I thought, like, okay, you know, that was that generation. So I don't be afraid of work, but don't mean working hard. I mean, don't mean you don't have to be kind. Um, so that's the advice I would give. And then the thank you is the, is the hardest part. Um, I heard General Rogers say at the leadership conference we attended not too long ago that you can always tell who has good parents. Mm. <laughs> and I said, you know what, that's true. That's true. And I had the best parents. And God gave me a lot of blessings, but having good parents was, man, I, when I look at what the odds was and what could have happened, <laughs> the fact that God gave me such hardworking parents, um, so my mom is here, and I want this little lady to stand up, if she will. <laughs> and I want to tell you just a brief thing about her. When I joined the Air Force, they talked to me about uh, integrity, service before self, and excellence. And I was like, Psh. my mother and father taught me that at the time I was a toddler. And they believed it. And my mom was born, and 1930, well, she's a year changes on me. <laughs> she was born on the, uh, in the segregated South, on the oppressed side of the tracks. And she had a lot of hardship. Her grandfather was a sharecropper and would have her, uh, you know, sharecropping with him. She lived majority of her young adult life not being able to, uh, have the rights to, to enjoy the liberties that we take for granted. Simple things. And uh, one of the earliest memories of my life is riding with her on a train. I was a little taller. And uh, on this train ride, I went to get some water. And they had this little cone where you could go to the water fountain. And I made my little way up there. And there was this lady that was encouraging me. And I got my water. And then. I started to fall because the train moved a little bit. And 
my little brain is like, <coughs> sensory overload, I got the water, but we're moving, I'm going down. And my mother's arm just came out of nowhere. Just stood me up. I held my water, and like, <laughs> pushed me right back up. And that, that scenario has repeated itself over and over in my life. Um, so many different, um, <laughs> <laughs> so many different areas where she's been there and uh, for all that she went through and all that she endured she didn't have like one ounce of bitterness mm -hmm. she is kind to everybody taught me to love everybody regardless of what their race color whoever treat everybody like you want to be treated so I was asking if you would do me a favor <coughs> and Nobody, everybody, everywhere I go, people thank me for my service. I'm telling you, everywhere I go. I can't go to a restaurant, somebody's buying me. I, George will tell you, I hide in the restaurant. <laughs> I literally hide. Because somebody's gonna feel like they have to come and pay my bill. And then when they pay my bill, I'm like, oh shoot, now they done paid my bill. How do I get to my Corvette? <laughs> <I'm> like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> All the time. Thank you for your service. And you saw the day. Uh, you saw the day, the love. And, uh, but my mom's been the wind beneath my wings. Nobody never thanked her for her service. <laughs> and there's a lot of people like that, you know, that just in the shadows that never been thanked. So today, Mom, if I don't do anything else, I want to say thank you for your service. Not only to me. My mother in law, once my mother in law, always my mother in law. <laughs> <laughs> I was deployed in Panama for months and months on, on end, and I ate more meals than this lady thought. <laughs> and like hiding in a restaurant, I would try to hide in her house, but she wouldn't know I was there because if she knew I was there, she was bringing me a plate, and I had just already eaten. <laughs> Didn't ask. Just, Come in, come out, here is your plate. I'm like, God bless my mother-in-law. Miss Dalis Tejada, te amo mami. Muchas gracias por todo. God bless you. <laughs> okay, I'm not gonna go through all of them. There's so many thank yous. My Liz drove all the way from Ohio with like, which way is Michigan, but I'm gonna find out. God bless her, man. <laughs> always there, always supporting me. I love you too, Auntie, thank you so much. I do wanna ask my siblings to stand up one second. Karen, my older sister, Randy, Selena, Mary, y'all all can just stand for one brief minute. These are my siblings. I can tell you, oh my God, they have been such a, such a support to me. My, old, my brother, my older brother, my older sister, they were just like, I wouldn't be here today were it not for them because they just did not let nobody mess with their little brother. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who it was. And um, I'm so honored that you guys came from so far. My brother came from California. My sister came from way down south. And my other sister came from way down south too. So. I, I love you guys. Thank you so much. I'm so honored by your presence. <laughs> then I also have to stand up my, my tripod, my boys, and my girls. Joshua, Laura, and Judah, would you please stand too for one minute? I can, 
I can't talk about these people without crying, so I'm just going to just say I love them so very much. Joshua and Laura, I, I, I'm so honored as a father that my oldest son and my oldest daughter, I have listened to them preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is the best honor that a father has. <laughs> <laughs> Judah's, uh, Judah's my baby boy. He came, uh, came in my life at a time when I wasn't expecting to have a baby boy. <laughs> and it just rejuvenated me. God knew what was best for me. And uh, God sent me Judah, and I thank God for him. So, all right, you guys sit down. You put water on. <laughs> to wrap this stuff up kind of quick. I gotta say thanks to uh, Johnny White, the Boom Section, George Hall. You guys worked so hard making this happen. Molly G, where is Molly? <laughs> Molly worked so hard also. I'm so thankful for all that work you guys uh, put in for me. Um, you guys, are we're we are brother in arms. So we're brother in arms forever. Uh, George and George and Johnny are the leadership of the section that I was supervisor of, and I heard uh, General uh, Rogers say that uh, your legacy is determined by uh, the person who replaces you, the character of the person who replaces you. And these guys already have replaced me, and that says great things about my legacy, because they're being a great honor and character, and the Boom section has a bright, bright future, and that does my heart better than I can express it. Thank you guys. <laughs> Pastor Bisker and the Bethesda Christian Church. I want to tell you something. Uh, we had uh, we had some training the other day and uh, Colonel Prasadik asked me what would I want my my guard organization to be like, to be described by. I said, I would like my guard organization to be a caring organization. And the same thing is true of my church. My church of Bethesda, we don't always agree on everything, um, but one thing is for certain, we truly care about each other. And it's a testament to the leadership that comes from uh, Pastor Bisker, Pastor Pat and Bis uh, Julie Bisker, the leadership and the legacy of that church. We all have our own differences. We have our own lives. We're, but we figured out that if we can't get together down here, we don't have to worry about what, how we're going get, to get together up there. And we ain't going. So uh, <laughs> I would like that everybody from Bethesda Christian Church, if you would stand briefly. To be recognized, my 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 saint. While they are standing, if you have a problem, and you don't know Jesus, and you got questions about Jesus, ask any one of these persons who are standing up. They will tell you everything that you want to know about the gospel. They will pray with you at the drop of a hat. And if you come to our church, don't get in between Denny and, uh, and, and Andrea because they will elbow you out the way to go praise the worship. <laughs> <laughs> and we are at 14,000 um, uh, Metropolitan Parkway at the corner of uh, Shaner, great big church. It's got to be a lot of room and a lot of seats. So anybody, <laughs> you are invited. Okay, guys, yeah, so you can sit down. <laughs> Kimmy Hall. <laughs> wow, you know, um, Jerry told me that you had a national anthem tradition that was like no other. And wow, he was absolutely correct. Thank you so much for your presence, for your commitment to the city of Detroit and to the community for all you do and for taking time out to come participate in this humble affair in such a glamorous, beautiful, magnificent way. Thank you very much.
almost there, guys. <laughs> Good Lord. I tell you, the thank yous are the hard part. Um, see, I got, uh, I'm going to ask Jerry Carr, Richard Marsh, <laughs> Kevin Jackson to stand. Oh, my <laughs> oh, tell you, These guys, man, you talk about a brotherhood. These guys have been. <laughs> wow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You've been that. You've been my best friend since me and Richard Fallon were uh, something like nine, a little lean at nine years old. <laughs> they have been my best friends. They have always been there. They've always supported me. They always want, don't hesitate to call me and you know, say, hey, brother, how you doing? I love you. Uh, it's just an easy thing to, you know, to do. Just uh, care about each other. They've always been here in my life. They're here today. I thank God for putting brothers in my life like you guys. Okay, sit down. You're making me cry. Diaz and Cannon, you guys, man, you're amazing. You're amazing. A lot, of, a lot of people tell me that, you know, I've been here a lot. People say, oh, Chief, you retired? I'm envious of you. I'm envious of you. You leave it. And I was like, you know what? In all honesty, I'm envious of you guys because you get to stay. And you still have a role to play in this great guard that we serve. You guys have uh, things ahead of you that you can't even imagine. So much fun, so much camaraderie, so many things to accomplish. So uh, I'm envious of you. But as my pastor said, to everything there is a season, there is a time for every purpose under heaven. I had my time on the walk on the wall. My watch lasted 33 years, and now it's my time to stand down off the wall. As they say in uh, Game of Thrones, Randy, <laughs> it's my time, and now his watch has ended. So I want to thank you guys for coming out and celebrating this with me. I love you all from the bottom of my heart. Um, and I just want to say God bless you and uh, God bless the Michigan Air National Guard. Thank you. Thank you.